Welcome to what you need to know about COVID-19 vaccines. This forum is co-hosted by Franklin Regional Council of Governments and LifePath. I'm Barbara Bodzin, Executive Director of LifePath, and I'm pleased to be tonight's moderator. Thank you for joining us via Zoom, by telephone, via television, and social media. We have tried to cover all means of communication to make this forum accessible to as many people as possible. Our hope for tonight is to offer information to help you make informed decisions related to how the vaccine works, safety concerns and possible reactions to the vaccine, efficacy rates, how the vaccine is being distributed regionally, and of course, the million dollar question of when will I be able to get vaccinated? So first, a couple of housekeeping items. If you would like to ask a question during this presentation, we will be picking up questions entered into the chats on Facebook and YouTube, and we will try to answer them at the end if time permits. Thank you for those who have submitted your questions ahead of time. Now on to our panelists. Each of these individuals have been intimately involved in the care and support of people in our local communities. The members of this group cover Franklin County in the North Quabbin region and beyond. I'd like to introduce Senator Joe Comerford, Dr. Stephen Segatori from the Community Health Center of Franklin County, Dr. Jennifer Schimmel, an infectious disease specialist with Bay State Health, Jennifer Hoffman, Director of Public Health for the City of Greenfield, Phoebe Walker, Director of Community Services at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Lynn Feldman, Director of Community Services at LifePath, Gina Campbell, Vice President of Clinical Operations, Valley Medical Group, and Evie Snyder, community member. So without further ado, let's move to the first slide and I'd like to ask Joe Com Comerford to start off by speaking to us about why the vaccine is important. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. Thank you uh, to LifePath, thank you to uh, FERCOG, thank you to uh, GCTV um, and to all the panelists, Bay State, Franklin Community Health Center, River Valley Health. Um, I'm just honored to join you this afternoon and talk about this really important topic. I also wanna just begin by thanking local public health officials who have also been on the front line for these many months battling all aspects of COVID, including now, um, especially uh, giving us access to the vaccine. I know that people know this, but the ravages of COVID uh, have long been with us these many months uh, and they've exposed inequities that have been present before COVID that now we see even more clearly. Um, they've also um, gotten us sick and here on this map you can see 3,012 people diagnosed it in, um, with COVID in Franklin County in the North Quabbin region. Um, these 3,012 people, of course, have thousands of close contacts. That means disruption to spouses, to children, to caregivers, uh, to colleagues uh, because of the impact of coming in close contact with COVID. And of course, we mourn the lives lost, 107 deaths in Franklin County alone. Next slide, if you could. One of the things that we talk about a great deal, uh, those of us who are doing this work in Franklin County is regional equity. Um, how do we assure that the people of our region have equal or equitable access? And I, again, I, the people I thanked at the beginning are the people that have my heartfelt thanks because you joined forces together um, to put Franklin County forward as a region. Um, and you are the reason that we are able to say on this map that 32% of the people in our county have at least one dose of vaccine. It's because of the collaboration, because of the creative scheduling uh, between sites, because of your dogged persistence at the state level uh, that we have been able to prevail as well as we've done. Uh, so thank you again for this and for all of us, for all of you who have raised your voices um, to the state to make sure that Franklin County, rural Franklin County has access to the vaccine that we need and deserve. Next slide. So here we're talking about 
uh, community immunity or herd immunity, but I but community immunity is the preferred term. And here it's I'll just talk at a very high level about what what we're going for here. Um, the vaccine offers us a ray of hope. It offers us a way forward uh, to restart life, to build back better as a region. But one of the things that we have to do is make sure that we essentially box out the vaccine by not giving it any place to land. Uh, so community immunity does that. And so when we take the vaccine, at least this is how I think about it, I'm not only taking it for myself and to put a blocker on that virus from coming into my region, but I take it for those among us who can't take the vaccine, for those among us who are sick or immunocompromised. Um, and so we protect ourselves, but we're really protecting our neighbors. And that's community immunity, um, I think at its very finest. And so with that, again, I'll offer my thanks to the organizers tonight and pass it on to Dr. Schimmel. Great, thank you for that uh, introduction. So as Dr. Comerford um, really alluded to, it's really um, the benefit, one of the main benefits of the COVID-19 vaccine is to keep our community safe. And I think you'll hear that emphasized throughout this talk. Um, it does you know, help you as an individual, um, to keep you from getting sick from COVID-19, but it really has a greater effect, um, you know, beyond just ourselves and even our families. Um, and of course, it is the combination of both getting the vaccine and following the CDC recommendation, whether it's mask wearing and social distancing, um, to give us full protection while we kind of get through this uh, difficult, the rest of this difficult time. Uh, but the, you know, overarching hope is really that as more people get vaccinated, um, that's when we can hopefully control COVID-19 and then get back to our normal lives um, in this community. So what exactly is a vaccine? So a vaccine is a way of preventing a disease that can be dangerous. And a vaccine uses our body's own defenses uh, to help our body develop protection from the disease, but without getting the disease. So what the vaccine is doing is it's basically helping our own immune system to produce something called antibodies. And to be honest, our bodies do the same thing when we're exposed to the actual disease. Our bodies make antibodies. After we get vaccinated, our bodies also make antibodies. But after getting vaccinated, we can hopefully get through without getting ill um, from the uh, disease, you know, specifically, obviously, for this, we're talking about COVID. And it goes on to give us, the antibodies give us protection from the disease without actually having to get the disease. I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit more specifically about the three COVID vaccines that are available in the US. I think really the important point um, to take away is they've all been shown to be safe and effective. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail because the vaccine um, technology is a little bit different from what we're used to, but not anything new or frightening. So two of the vaccines, the five, actually, if you could just leave us stay on that last slide for another minute. Uh, two of the vaccines, um, the one from Pfizer slash BioNTech and Moderna, those are both mRNA vaccines. And then the Johnson and Johnson slash Janssen vaccine is a little bit different in that it's a viral vector vaccine. Um, and just to mention, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the Pfizer vaccine is approved for those ages 16 and up, uh, where the other two currently are approved for ages 18 and up. So with this next slide, I'm just going to touch briefly, you'll see that this slide and the following one look very similar because both the mRNA um, vaccine technology and the viral vector technology are similar, but not exactly the same. So what happens uh, when we get an mRNA vaccine? The mRNA is something called messenger RNA, and it's a little piece of genetic material that's not altering our own DNA or our own genetic material, but it um, has a, it's in the vaccine with a coating on it that allows it this piece of mRNA to get into our own cells, and it triggers our immune cells to make antibodies. Um, and as I mentioned before, these antibodies then protect us in case we're exposed to the real virus and it enters our bodies. We already have, our immune system is kind of ready um, to attack the virus. And as I mentioned, um, you know, these mRNA vaccines are new in some ways, but not really. Vaccines of this type, um, you know, have been in development for close to 30 years. 
Um, some vaccines, um, kind of early mRNA vaccines have been studied since 2005. Uh, but it's really been within the last couple of years that some important groundwork um, has been laid to improve the stability and the delivery. This idea of coding this little piece of genetic material with kind of a, um, a coding that allows it to get into our cells so that our immune system can then make antibodies um, is what has really been improved. Um, and then we can go on to the next slide. You'll see the picture is very similar because really the idea behind a viral vector is, um, is similar. What a viral vector uses though, instead of a piece of mRNA or messenger mRNA, it uses something that looks like a harmless piece of the virus that uh, causes COVID-19. So it kind of looks like COVID-19, but it's not dangerous. It can't cause actual illness. And our immune, and then it does the same thing. It's put in, you know, it can get in, it gets into our cell, and then those cells are then triggered to produce antibodies, um, very much like um, the antibodies, you know, which are produced uh, in response to the mRNA vaccine. Um, and this just allows us, uh, you know, some degree of protection again, if, in case we are exposed to the real virus. Our bodies are kind of ready to fight the virus. Um, and this is an even older technology. It started to be, uh, the scientists began working with viral vector vaccines in the 1970s. And some of the vaccines that have been used in the Ebola outbreak have used this technology. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So again, you know, I, I think a concern that has arisen is, you know, were these vaccines, were they made too quickly to be safe? Um, and admittedly, the vaccine timeline, you know, has been shorter. It often takes, you know, 10 years or more for a vaccine, um, you know, to be made. And we have other illnesses that have been around for, you know, 30 years that we still don't have a vaccine for. So this definitely happened more quickly. Too quickly? I don't think so. And there's a few reasons um, for that. And a lot of it is because we already had some information about other coronaviruses you know, nothing quite as widespread as um, coronavirus, you know, as uh, COVID-19 has been, but there have been other outbreaks of other um, coronaviruses that also cause respir severe respiratory illness, but just much more localized. So scientists have already done some work um, when there was, you know, SARS-CoV-1, um, which was predominantly, you know, um, in a much more local or focused area, but there, you know, was research that was kind of already done, which laid some of the groundwork. Um, and another uh, respiratory virus called MERS. Um, and so some of those, that groundwork, scientists were able to build on that um, when making the vaccine for COVID-19. Um, as I mentioned, when I talked about the mRNA and viral vector technology, scientists have been working with this technology, you know, for the viral vectors, you know, since the 70s, for mRNA since the 90s. So some of that groundwork was already there too. So it wasn't like they were starting from nowhere, um, you know, to get the vaccine up and running. And obviously this, you know, outbreak has just been on such a large scale, um, you know, and um, just had so much national and international impact that there really was a lot of support for clinical trials, which is often difficult to come by. Um, but there was obviously government support that was very forthcoming. Uh, you know, without a lot of, you know, drug companies having to do fundraising and um, kind of get going slowly. So that really sort of helped to move along this process. Um, again, no shortage of volunteers, um, uh, which can sometimes be a, a roadblock for um, vaccines and for clinical trials. There were obviously plenty of people with a potential uh, risk for COVID, so people were willing volunteers. And something else, my last point I think is really, uh, you know, also very interesting. And it was just sort of a shift in um, how, you know, the manufacturing preparation was done. So because, you know, it was realized that this was going to be needed on such a large scale, that manufacturing preparation actually happened at the same time as the safety studies. Um, and the idea being that the vaccine would be ready to be distributed once they were approved. Um, and often this is really a huge, you know, uh, barrier in terms of uh, getting vaccines out and produced is that the manufacturing isn't ready. And that part can take years. Uh, but, you know, it was kind of part of the plan from early on that this not be the roadblock. Let's make sure it's safe and let's not have the manufacturing uh, really have to, you know, be a, uh, a stumbling block. So 
I think that should hopefully help answer the question of why the timeline was shorter, but too quick, I don't think, you know, probably not. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the testing that the vaccines have already undergone, you know, all vaccines undergo, you can see on the left side here, um, three phases of testing. And this was, this was all done for these uh, COVID vaccines. Phase one starts as a very small group of healthy volunteers. Um, and then phase, if, if that goes well, uh, vaccine studies progress to phase two, which is a little bit bigger group also of healthy volunteers, and then you know, much larger phase three effectiveness trials. Um, and that's exactly what was done for the three vaccines that we have available um, in the US. So just to give you an idea of numbers, the phase three trial for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine had over 43,000 participants, so more than 21,000 um, in each group. Uh, Moderna, a little bit smaller, but still over 30,000 participants, 15,000 people in each group. Um, and also the Johnson & Johnson, similar size to the Pfizer study. So very big studies, and that helps us to learn a lot about effectiveness and safety, um, which is you know, the next step. We can go to the next slide. So what happens after the phase three study um, is there's a you know, Center for Disease Control Advisory Committee they look at all the data that the companies supply from the study, and there's really two important pieces. One, obviously, to make sure the vaccine works, and the second piece, to make sure it's safe. And then this advisory committee gives advice to the FDA. The FDA does the you know, a, a review of the data and the advice from the committee. And what happened with these vaccines is they granted something called an emergency use authorization, which has been granted for all three of these vaccines. It's a little bit different from something that is officially approved, um, but um, you know, it, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about you know the criteria in order for something to be um, approved. And uh, specialists in infectious disease in Massachusetts also review all the research and write a recommendation memo for each vaccine um, to review it um, at a more local level as well. Next slide. So talking a little bit more about emergency use authorization and what is required um, in order to get that. So there has to be um, adequate manufacturing so that we are ensured that the quality and, you know, of the vaccine is good. Um, they also make sure that the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks of the vaccine. Um, so the reviewers looked at safety data from those early smaller studies. And then for the phase three, the larger study, they look at um, there needs to be at least a few months of follow up to make sure that the you know, vaccine is effective after completion of the uh, dosing. And then obviously another really important piece is the safety database. So at least um, you know, 3000 vaccine re recipients had to be reviewed for safety, followed for serious adverse events for at least one month after completion. And now, since most of those studies were done over the summer, um, you know, there's even more safety data that has accumulated. And it's not like everything stops there. There really is continued safety monitoring um, through both FDA and CDC. They lead this continuous monitoring um, to make sure that the vaccines, um, you know, still appear safe and that nothing kind of pops up um, later. So there's a bunch of different systems in place to rapidly detect any um, concerns for vaccine safety problems. So this is what is ongoing now, something called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, another vaccine safety data link, um, uh, another initiative called the BEST Initiative, and then also um, ongoing review of, of Medicare data. Um, and so if anything is picked up, then that can be uh, you know, reviewed for a possible safety concern. And next slide. Um, I did want to just um, kind of talk briefly about what's out there for children. You know, as I mentioned, the uh, two of the vaccines are approved for um, eight, uh, 18 and older and one for 16 and older. So as of right now, um, you know, where are we with vaccines for children and adolescents? So I think this is uh, encouraging as well. Um, for children 12 and older, uh, Pfizer has a study of 12 to 15 year olds that is already fully enrolled. They have over 2000 participants and actually they're expecting to be able to share data um, hopefully this summer. 
Uh, Moderna has also met their enrollment goal for um, kids ages 12 to 18. I believe they have 3,000 in that study, and I, I don't know the exact timeline of when they will share their data. Children under 12 is the next step. Um, Pfizer um, just started within the past few days, I believe they announced um, um, a um, 45, the, the eventual goal is to get to uh, about 4,500 children looking at three different age groups. And similarly, Moderna also just started um, looking at children between the age of six months and 12 years, looking at various doses. This study will be a little bit bigger, 6,000 children in the US and Canada. Um, and that this one is um, coordinated with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So I think more to come in terms of when, um, you know, when are children actually going to start vaccinated? I think that depends a little bit on the data and the timing. Um, but I did see um, over the past few days, the expectation is children 12 and older, maybe in time for school, you know, the new school year. Um, you know, late 2021, and then children under 12, um, the thought is really it would probably be sometime in 2022. And there are some plenty of questions that remain about COVID-19 vaccination um, that we don't have all the answers to. I think these are, you know, two big ones that are um, kind of at the forefront for those of us um, in infectious disease. Um, you know, can people who are vaccinated still get asymptomatic infection and possibly carry infection to others? Um, I, I will just say, you know, I, I think the short answer is we don't really know yet, but I will say there is rapidly accumulating data um, that is encouraging, that it does look like asymptomatic infection is less. It might not be zero, uh, but it is less when people are vaccinated. So I think more to come on, on that question. Um, but it is looking better than not being vaccinated. And similarly, the you know a big question on everybody's mind that I we do not have the answer to yet is you know how how long does this protection last? Um, and I you know there's ongoing studies, and hopefully that question will get answered in the coming months. Will we need a booster vaccine? I, I don't think we we have those questions yet uh, answered, but I hope that we'll get there. And I'm going to stop there and pass it along to. Uh, Dr. Steven Sagatori, uh, who will talk a little bit more about COVID vaccination. I was muted. Um, thank you, Dr. Schimmel, for that introduction. Uh, I've been charged tonight with um, busting some of the myths around COVID vaccine. They are persistent, they are virulent, and they are real. And they've been uh, circulating online since basically they started talking about vaccines. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the biggest uh, that is out there now is will the COVID-19 vaccine alter my DNA and essentially change me as a person? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, the, the, way, the way these vaccines work, uh, as Dr. Schimmel alluded to, is they are messenger RNA on the, on the Pfizer and the Moderna, and there is a, a viral vector vaccine, none of which enter the human uh, nucleus where the DNA is stored. Um, they actually teach the um, protein making mechanisms in the cell itself how to make the, the, the antibody to the uh, spike protein and it never gets into your cell and it's, it's, um, it degrades very quickly in the cell so it doesn't stay around long enough so it can't cause any damage to your DNA or your um, basic um, gene structure. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, uh, concerning for people who have job requirements for testing for work. Uh, will uh, the COVID-19 vaccine cause me to test positive uh, for COVID-19? Again, the short answer is no. Um, the way the vaccines work is they create um, uh, antigens related to the spike protein, and those are not picked up by the COVID test that we use in the field. Those are either an antigen test or a PCR, which looks for actual RNA material in the sample, which cannot be tricked by uh, the vaccine. There is some thought that um, in the future, you know, very sensitive uh, antigen testing, blood testing may um, prove um, that for like, immunity, but not for testing positive. So that would not, it should not and will not uh, affect um, COVID testing. So if you were to have a vaccine and um, 
then within the, if you weren't fully vaccinated, you could theoretically test positive and at that point, there's a chance you could be ill, but it's not related to vaccine failure, it's related to not being fully vaccinated at that time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is an area that has had a lot of um, concern and conversation um, about COVID-19 and pregnancy. Um, there is a pretty significant online um, uh, movement about um, that the vaccine will make it difficult to get pregnant. Um, basically, what, what they're saying online is that the antibodies um, to the spike protein of COVID-19, which the vaccine creates, is uh, similar to a, a placenta protein that uh, the, old, with the um, fertilized egg um, will implant into the uterus and they're completely separate spike proteins. They're not genetically related. This vaccine will not um, keep uh, women from um, potentially getting pregnant. Um, the other next, next big one would be, can I get the COVID-19 vaccine if I am pregnant, thinking of becoming pregnant or breastfeeding in the near future? The short answer is yes, but it is a nuanced yes uh, that should always be a record, always be a conversation between uh, the woman and her healthcare provider. That said, um, the CDC, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists all recommend uh, that at least pregnant individuals have access to the vaccine, and um, depending on their shared decision making with their healthcare professionals, um, to make their own choice but also know that uh, women who are pregnant have a five times more likely chance of ending up in the ICU or on a ventilator compared to non-pregnant women and up to a 70% 70 70 increase in death. Uh, and this uh, source was from Tufts Medical Center. Um, the other uh, interesting thought would be uh, if I'm pregnant, the vaccine won't help protect my baby. And well, the answer there is a bit um, unclear at this point, but there is emerging evidence uh, coming out of Boston, um, they have followed um, pregnant and then women who have also delivered and or breastfeeding since December. Uh, and there is some suggestion that there is uh, antibody being transferred in breast milk and cord blood. So there is some, some beginning signal that there could be immunity transferred to the fetus um, with a um, parent who has been vaccinated. Uh, next slide, please. A great concern to many people um, would be, does getting the vaccine at, um, alter your immigration status or your public charge status? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, the federal government has confirmed that it will not consider a COVID-19 treatment, including vaccine, as part of the uh, public charge determination as it relates to benefit conditions, um, even if the vaccine is paid for by Medicaid or federal funds. Um, someone with allergies should avoid getting the vaccine. That is another nuanced answer, but in general, unless you've had an anaphylactic reaction to one of the components of the, the vaccine, uh, many people um, can do the uh, coronavirus vaccine very safely. Uh, often with a history of allergy, we will have people stay longer for monitoring, usually 30 minutes after vaccination. If people are severely allergic to anything, we recommend that they have an EpiPen with them. Um, but I can tell from anecdotally from uh, personal experience, having observed several hundred vaccinations now, we have not had any anaphylactic reactions to uh, the Moderna vaccine. At least I can say that for certain um, in our health center. Uh, I don't know about other health centers, but that's our experience um, at the community health center. And um, the last persistent um, myth is, well, the microchip. No, the vaccines are not designed to implant microchips. There is no credible evidence. There is no, um, there is no uh, way it can actually be done in this particular way. So I would say that that is um, one that hopefully we can put the rest at this point. It's time and on to Tika Walker. Thank you. And I think there was, however, a uh, question.
question that just came in during, from the Q&A that maybe either you or Dr. Schimmel would like to address about, about infertility for men. I know we talked about pregnancy for women, but do you want to do that before I move on? Sure, I can um, answer that. Did you want me to address the question in women as well? Sure. Okay, so yes, this started, um, and it is a, a sort of a, another myth, kind of hands down, um, but this started very also early in the vaccine, even coming just to healthcare workers. And there were certainly healthcare workers who were concerned about it, but uh, that has really been largely debunked that it has, you know, anything to do with causing infertility. I think it was um, initiated by a, a letter from um, some anti-vaccine folks in Europe claiming that the protein um, that was included the vac in the vaccine was similar to a protein that is, you know, important for um, placental development. And it's not true. <laughs> that's not the protein that's in the vaccine. Um, you know, and it's not anything that our bodies would be prompted to make an antibody to. So that one, uh, you know, has not been found to be true. And as uh, Dr. Segatory mentioned, there has been sort of increasing evidence of its safety um, in pregnant women and in women who are, um, you know, have been trying to conceive. To be honest, I'm not aware of any rationale or um, about uh, infertility in men. So I, I don't even know that a mechanism has been proposed for that. And uh, that is certainly um, not anything that, uh, you know, ha has come up in any safety studies either. You know, that, that's true. I've, uh, they, the data I've seen in all the safety data, there's no signal at all for male infertility, at least in the uh, data to date. Okay, thanks. So I'll go on to just um, introduce the section about accessing the vaccine locally, something that we are all spending a lot of time doing. I know, I'm sure everybody watching is. Um, and um, there will be a lot more time for answering the medical questions that have come in as we get through this too. So really my only, um, my only slide here is just to explain where we are in the eligibility uh, calendar. And that is, you can see here that everybody who is 60 and over and workers in transit, grocery, utility, farms, sanitation, public works and public health are all eligible as of right now. And as of the fifth, uh, people 55 and over and people with just one of the medical conditions from the medical condition list um, will become eligible. So that is very soon. And then looking ahead just a few short weeks, everybody 16 and over, although please do note what Dr. Schimmel said, 16 year olds can only get the Pfizer vaccine, um, which right now is found mostly at mass vaccination sites. Um, so um, that's where we are in terms of who can get it when. This was the outcome of a many, many months planning process at the state level uh, to look at what kinds of people were most at risk of dying and how to get them the vaccine the quickest. Uh, it's certainly been a, a lumpy rollout, but, um, but I do want people to know one thing, which is that part of why it was slow is we were being very careful in Massachusetts to really think about who was most at risk of dying because the vaccines primary function is to keep people uh, from dying so we do not lose any more of our neighbors. So just in case questions come up about why did it take so long and why these different slices, that's, that's where that came from, um, a state vaccine advisory committee that I was honored to sit on. I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Hoffman, the director of public health for the city of Greenfield to talk about where you can get your vaccine. Oh, Jen, you're muted. Thanks, Phoebe. <laughs> um, first, I wanna recognize um, that I know how frustrating it is for everyone to obtain a vaccine right now. And um, everyone on this panel could probably agree to that. So I was asked to uh, discuss some of the resources in our region. And the uh, one that has the most options available is the state website, which is vaxfinder.mass.gov. Um, this uh, has sites in the Greenfield Health Department, the Orange Board of Health, Franklin County Vaccine Collab Collaborative, and basically everyone in our region posts their clinic at this site. Uh, the Greenfield Health Department 
um, also has its own clinic and uh, you can call the hotline number, which is 413-775-6411. And when you do call that number, please include your name, address, and phone. And if you know the priority group you're in, um, usually a callback occurs within a week or so. And um, you can also email uh, Greenfield Health Department at vaccine.clinics at greenfield-ma.gov. Uh, the Franklin County Vaccine Collaborative Hotline is posted also. It's 413-774-3167 at extension 153. And um, their website actually has links not just to um, Greenfield and the other places. It also has links to CVS and UMass and mass vaccination sites. Um, and it basically has just a lot of information and upcoming clinics that are happening. So the vaccines are there. Um, they are coming to Massachusetts um, on a, in an increasing amount. So we're just asking everyone to be patient. And um, we want to get vaccines to you as soon as we get them to us. And on that note, I will return this over to Lynn Feldman. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Lynn Feldman. I work for LifePath, which is the Area Agency on Aging in uh, Franklin County in the North Quabbin. We provide services and supports to older people, people with disabilities, and caregivers, actually all throughout Western Massachusetts. And in this role, and it's in our mission to uh, help older people, people with disabilities and caregivers stay independent, we have committed ourselves to helping those who want a COVID-19 vaccine to access one. So as we know, this has been a primarily an online process for people to access those vaccinations. So we understand that not everyone uses the internet, not everyone has access. Um, and so we have set up a helpline explicitly for the purpose of helping people without internet access, as well as those people who may need a little additional help with transportation or who might need an in-home vaccine. So if you do have internet access, you should be utilizing the resources that Jennifer spoke of in order to register for a vaccination or to pre-register yourself to get a call when there is a local vaccina a vaccination available to you. But if you do not have access to the internet, if you're watching, um, by a television or calling in today by the phone, you can give us a call. And that phone number is 413-829-9285. Again, that's 413-829-9285. Um, and uh, leave us a message and we will add you to our waiting list. And uh, we have a team of about 12 volunteer callers and 24 or so drivers who are working to register people as appointments become available and to provide uh, transportation. So far we have helped about 250 people register for appointments, people without internet, and we have provided about 30 rides to clinics so far. We had a question from the community uh, before this about whether or not it is safe to, to give someone your personal information to help you register on the computer? This is a really good question. And our suggestion would be to um, consider only sharing your personal information with a reputable organization that you are familiar with. So for example, LifePath, we are not saving any health information, uh, the health insurance card information that you give us. Our volunteers are just walking through the process of entering that data into the, the computer um, and uh, your, your information is, is secure uh, through that process. But uh, be very cautious about sharing information with individuals or other organizations that you may not be familiar with. And we recommend never sharing any information with someone who calls you um, out of the blue uh, anything. And we also want to make sure that everyone knows that at no point will anyone ask you for a credit card number while you are registering for a vaccination. So if anyone asks you for a credit card number or financial or your bank account information, you need to hang up because that is, um, that is not a legitimate service that's being offered. Next slide, please. LifePath has been working to help register people for vaccinations who need an in-home vaccine. 
uh, among the people that we are currently serving. And we're also ready to help the general public uh, for those of you who may be homebound. You can certainly call the helpline that I mentioned a minute ago, but I wanted to provide a little bit more detail about how the homebound vaccinations are being handled if you are a person who is not able to leave your home uh, to get a, vac a vaccination. So each board of health is responsible for its own uh, residents who need an in-home va uh, vaccine. So the, um, the process is being handled a little bit differently depending on the towns that you live in. So um, Montague residents, you should uh, get in touch with your board of health at 413-863-3200, extension 205. If you happen to be a resident of Orange, New Salem, or Wendell, you should contact the Orange Board of Health at 978-544-1107. Residents of the 15 FERCOG uh, Community Public Health Service member towns should uh, reach out to Lisa White at 413-665-1400, extension 114. And everyone else, or if you're not sure if your town is one of the 15 count, towns covered, you can feel free to give Life Path Helpline a call, um, <clears throat> or you can call the state homebound vaccination program and reach someone to get you connected with the proper um, local resource to get your that get you the in-home vaccination. So that number is 833-983-0484. That's a lot of information to remember. So if you have any confusion or questions, um, you can call the call Life Path, or you can also pick up the phone and just call 211 to connect with someone at the state who will direct you to, to the correct uh, resource. And Lynn, I wanted to just add something else about vaccine access before we move on to Gina. Um, and that is that um, many people may have heard the president say uh, that soon 90% of Americans would live with, would be within five miles of a, of a vaccine clinic. Um, that's not us in our rural county folks. Um, that is largely based on the fact that the federal government will be sending a lot more vaccine to CVS pharmacies um, and including many in Massachusetts. And then they are also setting up a, a, a very high throughput site in, um, in Boston. Um, so just wanted people to understand that while there is more vaccine coming, um, the state's vision is really that the vast majority of the vaccine um, is coming to either pharmacies or mass vaccination sites. So we will be seeing a lot more of it there than we will see here. And regionally, we are really just trying to make sure that anybody with access issues uh, to the mass vaccination sites is served by our regional vaccines. Um, and also, uh, we have had some questions about kinds of vaccine. Um, it, it should always say when you get on the state site which kind of vaccine is being um, offered. And um, in general, locally, you're never given an opportunity to choose. We, 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 we don't have two at once. Um, so we have what we have. Um, and Greenfield has what they have. And the health center has what they have. And um, so just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you. And I think we can turn it over to Gina Campbell. From Valley Medical Group. So good evening. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to see so many folks here. Gina Campbell, I work at Valley Medical Group. I'm a registered nurse. And a lot of folks ask the question, so how will I feel after the vaccine? Um, and I, I really want to share that. And I've been vaccinated as a healthcare worker because I do interact with the patients in our health centers. Really, um, there are very, very few rare um, side effects from the vaccine. Um, if you've had a flu vaccine before, you might remember some of the most common side effects from a vaccine as they're listed on your screen. You know, maybe you're tired, you have a small headache, uh, you might have a little pain uh, where they actually gave you the shot in the arm, some muscle or joint pain, chills, um, nausea or vomiting or fever, but we're really not seeing a lot of side effects. Um, I do know from the studies, both of the Pfizer and the Moderna, which I've read more about, um, really 1% of the, the, the participants in the studies had some side effects. Um, most side effects that we're hearing about are some minor side effects after the second injection if you have a two-shot vaccine. Um, I've had the chance to talk to um, many of our patients when they come in for their second dose and then I see them sometime later because they're in for health care. And even though some of them had some mild side effects, really all said we were so grateful to get that vaccine. It was worth 
my little headache or it was worth the pain in my arm, I'm really grateful to be vaccinated. Uh, next slide, Phoebe. Um, and then there's a lot of questions and actually some of this was talked about earlier, but I think it's important to share again. Um, when will it be effective? So what you see and all the information that's being shared from um, our scientists and our healthcare workers, really they talk about the two weeks after you've had your second dose of a two dose vaccine or about two weeks after you've had the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, but we're not really sure how long it lasts yet. Um, I think that's still under study by you know, the scientists, um, uh, Dr. Fauci, the CDC, I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that. Um, and it is also, possible that you could become infected with the COVID-19 virus. Probably very small chance, but there's always that small chance that you might have been infected right before you got the vaccine or exposed right after you got your second dose of the two two dose vaccines or, or the one dose vaccine. We're not hearing a lot about that, but um, as Dr. Schimmel said earlier, we're still not sure about that transmission piece um, from somebody who's been vaccinated. There's one more slide, Phoebe. And then, um, so I'm vaccinated, what do I need to do now? Uh, well, we still have to follow all of the really important safety standards we learned this past year. I can tell you at, my, at Valley Medical Group, my team is really, they hear me say this every day, we know the four things we must do. We've got to wash our hands. Uh, I'm sure most of you all have an alcohol hand wash in your home. You've used it at the grocery store. I keep it in my car. It is in my car to use after everything I do outside of my place of work in my home. We still have to wear a mask. And if you've kept up with what the CDC says about masks, they actually recommend uh, a surgical mask and then your cloth mask over it because it really keeps that surgical mask nice and snug to your face. We have to continue that six feet of social distance if it's not somebody who you might call in your pod or who you live with in your family. Um, and really avoid um, large groups, large gatherings. Um, our governor and all the great work being done at the state talks about very finite numbers you might be able to gather with, and those are really important. I know there's some holidays coming up, some religious holidays for some, and it's really important once again to think about who should you be spending time with right now and who shouldn't you. There might still be a good reason for some Zoom gatherings or Facebook gatherings to continue to keep you safe. So these four safety mechanisms, these four tools are still extremely important. And I'm in the healthcare world, we're actually talking about, does our future hold a lot more mask wearing in the future? Is it every flu season that I might have a mask on when I leave my home or wear a mask at work? We've really learned some important things about these safety tools that we can use for the future. And I believe I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Botson and we've got a community member who is here, which I'm so excited to hear what she has to share with us tonight. Thank you, Gina. And I would like to introduce Evie Snyder, who is going to speak about some of her contemplations before getting vaccinated her ex and her experience with getting the vaccine. So Evie, on to you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, I just want to start with saying a week ago, I participated in a day of remembrance at the Cooley Dickinson Hospital alongside healthcare professionals who treated COVID patients both during and after a hospital stay. My heart was reawakened to the challenges and trauma they have faced. I was invited to this event as a former patient of critical care at the hospital, having survived COVID-19. Though many bonds were for formed during my hospital stay, something I realized after attending this event was that we shared something else, firsthand knowledge of how devastating this virus can be. From this experience, I have gained a healthy fear and at times have worried about the consequences of getting this virus again at that level. The healing process from COVID was long and strenuous. With this as background, I was grateful and amazed at the remarkable effort on the part of our science community and pharmaceuticals to have been able to roll out a vaccine in what appeared to be record time while employing rigorous health and safety protocols. I chose to trust that the well being of our global community was the priority. For me, there was never a doubt. I was on board from the start to be vaccinated. After all, 
I have vaccinated throughout my life for a variety of diseases, as well as my children, and have felt you know, fortunate for these healthcare options. <clears throat> but there was a bit of difference for me having just recovered from COVID-19 and hearing that survivors like myself were having robust responses to the vaccine. I was wondering if I could handle the fear that would arise when experiencing COVID-like symptoms. So yes, I was nervous about getting the vaccine and presented my fears to my pulmonologist after having made my first appointment. Without hesitation, she declared, congratulations, I am so happy for you. Go for it, this will be no problem, you can handle it. So with my confidence buoyed, comfort level strengthened, I was prepared, I, I was prepared for my first appointment. Mind you, I would have had the vaccine if she said it might be difficult for me. So fortunate, I was very fortunate to have made my appointment at UMass so close to home. The infrastructure could not have been better. Once arriving at the designated site, each, each site of the registration um, ran smoothly and quickly with the entire process running less than an hour including 15 minutes of wait time post-vaccine. The individuals supporting the process appeared to be local volunteers, students, professors, retirees, my neighbors, with the efforts of the community fully on board. There was a feeling of cooperation and hospitality. Nursing students giving the injections were kind, caring, informative, and expert. They even provided a designer band-aid, which my granddaughter admired. This part of the process took minutes only, and then the 15-minute wait, and I was off to the rest of my afternoon. Symptoms following the vaccine were somewhat variable, starting the morning after the injection. The first time, I had a headache, fatigue, and a sore arm at the site of the vaccine and arm stiffness, and that lasted four days, but not keeping me from working, caring for my granddaughter and exercise. The second injection, um, I awoke on the next morning quite tired and not feeling well, which only lasted a day. Um, even my arm pain did not last long, and I did not feel any of the anticipated threat of, when experiencing coast um, post-vaccine symptoms. Um, when people <clears throat> excuse me, when people congratulated me for having received the vaccine, I did not resonate with this notion, but do feel so grateful to have been able to receive a vaccine that may prevent me from experiencing such life-threatening symptoms should I encounter this virus again. It has also left me feeling slightly more comfortable in being out in the community those safety precautions, wearing a mask, social distancing, not taking unnecessary risks are still the order of the day for me. Certainly, when returning to the Cooley Dickinson to commemorate the anniversary of a year fighting COVID, I felt more assured knowing I was with a community of people who had been vaccinated, ensuring a higher level of safety for all of us. I want to close with thanking the sponsors and participants of this program, working hard to ensure a high level of vaccinated members in our community. So thank you. Thank you, Evie, for sharing your story. It's really an important one to share for people with reluctance, for people who are in your position, and uh, it's very meaningful. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's great being here. Thank you. Okay, well, look at us, we're ahead of schedule, that's fabulous. So we do have quite a few questions. Some of them um, have been addressed to some degree. Um, we have identified uh, who is most appropriate to answer them. So without further ado, I think I will start asking the questions. Can I just run in one minute just to thank Senator Comerford for joining us because I know she has yes. another thing she needs to, she needs to go to. Um, thank you so much for joining us. 
many, many thanks to Senator, Senator Comerford for being with us today and for all of your tremendous advocacy through this entire process. And you have been in the forefront um, um, with, with, with the legislatures and with the, the governor and um, it certainly is felt locally. Well, I'm grateful for all of you and thank you so much. I learned a great deal this evening from all of you um, and grateful to be with you. Thank you. Okay, so first question for Jennifer Schimmel. Could you clarify why I might not get a vaccine for, for why I might get a vaccine for a current strain when I have been hearing for the last six months that the virus keeps mutating and making stronger strains? Am I supposed to get, keep getting shots forever? And at that, which shot is the right one assuming that, that it is the way to go? Uh, that's a really good question and uh, definitely brings up some important issues that are not just, uh, you know, on, I think, the minds of people in the community, but really on the minds of, you know, leaders in the field of infectious disease and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, folks involved in this effort. So um, just to, I think I'll just start with a little bit of background about the variants, not to get into too much detail, but you've probably heard, you know, of the UK variant. And that is probably one of the more widely circulating at this time um, variants. And I, I took a look yesterday at the Massachusetts page of the CDC. And, you know, we don't know what the, we, it's not like we test every virus to look at, you know, how many variants do we have compared to the original strain. But when they do the variant, the strain, the, when they do do testing, the predominance variant has been this UK variant. And so far, um, we do know from studies that have been done that um, it does seem that there is good protection from the current vaccines against this UK variant. And just for a little bit of um, framework, you know, on the Massachusetts, um, you know, in terms of how many they're tested, there were 441 of the UK variant. Um, compared to like four of the Brazil variant and nine of the South African. So obviously, you know, a hundred times more of this UK variant. And I think it should be very reassuring that we already have some evidence that the vaccine is protective um, against this predominant variant uh, strain from the UK. Um, you know, there is some data that maybe the virus is a little bit less effective against um, these much less common variants, but a lot of that information so far is sort of in the lab. We don't really know yet in practice. Um, and so for now, the best thing that we can do is to use the vaccines that are available that we know work against the majority of the virus, um, including you know, the predominant variant that we have in Massachusetts. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the main gist is what we have now is a good place to start um, yeah, we're all wondering kind of what comes next. And uh, there's really multiple ongoing studies and, you know, some of the vaccine companies are looking at doing an additional dose or changing their current vaccine and certainly more to come uh, to be able to better answer the question about what's next with the variants. But for where we are now, just getting the vaccines that are available is a good start. Thank you. Okay, this is a two part question. You've answered it some already, but I will repeat it because there's a, a little nuance to it. Um, once one has had both shots of, of vaccine and a month or more has passed, can we be sure that we will not pass COVID on to family, i.e. grandchildren? Yeah, this is a really good question also. And um, we don't know entirely. It does look from some of these early studies, um, you know, of the vaccine out there in the real world that the degree of what we call, you know, when you can pass it on without even realizing you're sick, that's called an asymptomatic infection because people might, might not have any symptoms. If they have symptoms, they would know to, you know, stay away from grandchildren and whatnot. But if that's so, that's really the concern that you'll have no symptoms, but the virus will be, you know, kind of where it lives and in, in our nose and could, uh, potentially be passed on to somebody um, who's not protected yet. And I think that is still, unfortunately, a little bit of a gap in our knowledge. It seems like those asymptomatic infections are less with vaccination, um, but they're probably not zero. So I, I think really more to come 
on that. And I think we can find some comfort in the fact that, you know, it's going to occur less often with vaccine, um, but it, it's not an absolute yet in terms of predicting us from asymptomatic infection. Thank you. And the second half of this question, I would assume uh, Phoebe or Jennifer Hoffman might be the best. Um, so I will be on a trip to Iceland in July as part of a geology course. There are strict requirements for certification of receiving the shots. At UMass, I received a COVID-19 vaccination record card. Will this be sufficient? We think so. That's that's yes. pretty much all you're going to be given. So exactly, <laughs> that that's is the, the only official, proof we have. The official U.S. government proof of the of the vaccine. So don't lose it. Yes. Great. Yes. Um, I think there was another one in the in the Q and A as well. Is there? I think maybe about the same stuff Dr. Segatori was talking about earlier. Uh, my 20 something? Yeah. Okay. My 20 something granddaughter has heard and read on the internet that there, that there were many miscarriages after being vaccinated. I have referred her to several medical based websites, but not making much progress. Any ideas? Well, um, that is, that is a uh, it's a large concern for many people. Um, there is some good uh, data that was released in early March by the vaccine committee, um, and I'll just kind of it's a lot of numbers, and I'll just kind of throw them out there quickly and kind of give some context. But there was over thirty thousand pregnant women enrolled um, in the um, the VSafe um, app after they got their vaccine. So they've been following thirty plus thousand women since the beginning of the vaccinations in December. Um, and they've had detailed information on 1,800 of those women all the way through their pregnancies. And based on data available as of the end of February, they look specifically at miscarriages, stillbirths, premature eruption of membranes. Uh, and uh, in that group, there, were, there was no higher incidence of any of those pregnancy complications in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. Um, so it's what's called within the background rate. So you'd expect if 30,000 people are pregnant, you'd have a certain number of them have a miscarriage, a certain number of them have, uh, have uh, a stillbirth, a certain number have premature eruption of membranes. And um, that group was not any different uh, because of the vaccine or after the vaccine. So the vaccine is considered quite safe from that standpoint. Uh, there's, there's no signal that it creates any further risk to pregnancy. Um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has some very good information on COVID-19 on their website, as well as the Society for Fetal Medicine. They have a very good um, page on uh, COVID-19 and its implications for pregnancy as well. Thank you. All right. So this could be for Dr. Segatori or for Dr. Schimmel. Um, what happened to the flu? Why did the entire incidence of flu deaths fall from approximately 22,000 deaths in 2019 to 179 in the 20, 2020 to 2021 season? How is this possible? This is suggestive of extreme data manipulation. I can start to answer this one. No, I don't think so at all. You know, and this was actually even during the summer when it was not our flu season, but the Southern hemisphere had their flu season. Uh, it was a much more gentler flu season. Um, and honestly, it's amazing, um, but it's probably related to mask wearing and hand washing um, throughout the flu season. So um, yeah, I think a, a flu season may never will hopefully never be the same again uh, with what we've learned from this. Um, there are maybe a, a few bright spots in all this, but yeah, I, I think it really speaks to um, just what the public health measures uh, did in terms of really minimizing the impact uh, that flu had this year. And I think we were, you know, initially before we saw how the Southern hemisphere um, got through their flu season, I think a lot of us were already sort of gearing up for, you know, the dual, issue over the winter of flu and COVID. And thankfully that that didn't happen. We really saw very, very little, um, you know, so much so that, you know, the, the schools and, you know, 
other institutions kind of put aside their requirement for a flu vaccine because it's really COVID that is still the problem, but flu, flu is not an issue. Which uh, working in elder services with a, um, and with younger people with disabilities, vulnerable populations, it has you know, raised questions in terms of transmission of other, other viruses and some of the universal precautions we take and the lessons that we've learned here and are there you know, habits that we should really continue to hold on to going forward? Yeah, I can say you know, for, for us at the health center, we are actively looking at masking for flu seasons for the forever. You know, it's just going to become part of our standard practice now. And I also work at a teaching hospital in Boston and that's also something that we are considering um, long-term. And I think it's a great idea because just look at, I mean, we've kind of, we know the PPE works, right? It, it works. The masks work, hand washing works. Uh, and it's a very simple thing to do. So hopefully it's, uh, we learn this lesson and carry it forward. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna open this up to anyone who wants to venture to answer it. Uh, do the vaccine companies have any liabilities if I get ill, sick or experience effects from the vaccines or do they have legal immunity per the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, which grants vaccine makers immunity from lawsuits related to injuries caused by vaccines? We forgot to invite a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We'll, we might need to get back to you on that. But it, I, okay. it sounds to me a little bit like the questioner may have answered their own question. Sounds um, like. Um, while I'm unmuted, I wanted to just um, ask everyone listening and watching to let um, neighbors who are uh, enrolled with the VA know about an upcoming vaccine clinic in Bernardston. Um, just for any veteran of, of any age enrolled in the VA. And um, that is on Tuesday, April 6th, and by appointment only. And you need to call 413-582-3110 for an appointment. Um, just want, we just got that from the um, Greenfield and Regional uh, Veteran Services Organization. So I wanted to make sure people knew about that. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question about um, issues of people who are supposed to get a second vaccine, the Moderna or the Pfizer, because of supply, um, there's no uh, second vaccine available. So if someone can speak to the efficacy of the one vaccine and what happens if they go over the 28 or 30 day waiting period uh, for, the, for the second vaccine. I can, I'll take that one. So there's, um, actually Dr. Schimmel mentioned the study earlier. There's a study that came out of the CDC earlier this week that's showing about 80% efficacy after the first dose. Um, so that's really encouraging. That's real world data. That's, um, that's following people from December through March um, while variants are circulating and uh, everything else. So it's a very encouraging data. Um, but there is also, um, people can get the vaccine the second dose, you know, six or eight weeks after the first dose, it's, it's not a, it's not written in stone. They have to get it, you know, 28 days or 21 days after there is a grace period after the vaccine. So I would suggest that they get the vaccine, their second dose as soon as they can get it. Thank you. Someone's asking, is it possible to get the J and J vaccine? I have rheumatoid arthritis and have experienced a cyto cy cytokine storm before and I'm worried about anything that deliberately induces immune activity. If the question is about, I can't speak obviously to the allergy thing, I think hopefully, hopefully Stephen or Jennifer can, but there it is clear when you sign up um, what kind of vaccine the place is offering. So for instance, the vaccine clinics that we, the clinic that we have coming up at the Treehouse Brewery this Thursday is exclusively Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. So that changes what we get from the state. We can't actually control, um, although we always have the second dose, the matching second dose for people, but first doses, we don't, we don't control um, what we get. But yes, it is possible to know what kind you are signing up for and get it. And 
I don't know if anybody wants to speak to whether that person's experience would seem to indicate that Johnson and Johnson would be something they would want. I can just say I haven't seen anything um, specifically recommending one over the other, you know, but certainly something maybe to discuss with your specific provider, but I, I haven't seen anything um, like that yet. Mm -hmm. And the question that came in the chat about if your first dose was one kind, can your second dose be the other? That is not recommended, but I have heard the department say, if you literally cannot ever find another one of the kind you needed, you can get the other kind as your second dose, but it is definitely not recommended. And since you have longer than the number of day of weeks, um, that would definitely be better for you. Is that right? Um, I believe our, I'm sorry, Dr. Secretary, did you want to say something? No, I think I just unmuted by accident. Okay. So this last one has been addressed, but I'm wondering if there's any other suggestions. Best suggestions for refuting the non-scientific facts that people are hearing, passing around, and keep people resistant to vaccination. You know, I'll say something, Barbara. One of the things uh, I talked to uh, the clinical nursing team a great deal at Valley Medical Group when we're doing patient teaching is to always reference credible websites. So when folks are out on the internet, credible websites are, you know, the CDC or LifePath or the Franklin Regional Council of Governments or, you know, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has put a great deal of information out there for citizens to read. You have to be very careful when you start to search to look at the website you're actually using. That's a great suggestion. Any, any last minute contemplations, reflections of any of the panelists? I guess I just want to say that this is a, a, a wonderful county and, and a wonderful region and people are working so incredibly hard together to take care of the residents. And so I, I encourage people to reach out to anybody on this, on this event. Um, if you're struggling uh, to find a vaccine, if you have follow-up questions, um, uh, really it's been a very, very heartwarming experience to work with the, the, just so folks know, like the hospital, the community health center, Valley Medical Group, the health departments, public health nurses, we meet regularly, we talk through the barriers people are experiencing, we try to set up systems to get people access to vaccine who are struggling, um, and folks here really are working very well together, and I think if you have suggestions for any of us about how we could be working even better together, we, we, are, we, we welcome that, and um, just know that so much of what is frustrating about this process for people is not in our control. And regionally, we're working very hard to, to, to make every possible um, easy accommodation for the things we can't control, um, which is how much vaccine we get, <laughs> what time of week, the week we get it, <laughs> um, and the rules under which we are operating. Um, so I know people feel very, very challenged by access to the to vaccine locally because the vast majority of the vaccine is going somewhere else and our clinics by the law, by our agreement, the only reason why we're getting local vaccinations um, into local health departments in Franklin County and in the North Quabbin is because we have to make those available on the state website for anyone. Um, and, um, and so we, we do put out every Monday morning on that franklincountymavaccine.org website, what time of day we will be turning ours live on the state website. Then you go to vaxfinder.org, you search for the clinic you want. So you write in treehouse or, you know, April 1st. And then when you get to that place, you just wait in that waiting room until we turn it on. And that's how local folks can get access uh, to those um, to those spots, which we're sorry it isn't easier, but it is the hand we've been dealt and we're um, working to try to make it easier for folks. Um, and obviously the healthcare settings, it's different. You have different ways of accessing it. And that information is also all on that website. That's all I wanted to say is just what a great group of people this is and this region has for trying to work together to address this horrific pandemic. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, Phoebe. I have to reflect your, your I have to echo your reflections. Um, it's given me opportunity to connect with people I haven't connected with before or reconnect with some. 
Um, it's the, the collaborative efforts in this region is just energizing to keep me going. Um, between that, the uh, volunteer um, support that we have gotten in the community to help out with the vaccination efforts with, with all the COVID efforts with transportation um, has just been amazing. Uh, let me just put out, if any of you need any vaccinators, we have healthcare professionals who are just clamoring to, to be out there supporting that effort. So please uh, let us know. Um, and you know, there's been so many silver linings and um, the, other, the last thing I'll have, I have to say uh, before my closing is that um, the Secretary of Elder Affairs had reflected a while ago about just continue to message that it has been frustrating to find a vaccine and people are spending hours and days and so much time and emotional energy on this, but just keep the faith that there will be enough vaccine for everyone. It might take a bit longer, but everyone who wants to get vaccinated will get vaccinated eventually. Other, other reflections? Also, Barbara, there's a question in the Q&A about what does anyone know about when councils on aging and senior centers will reopen? Lynn? Thanks for that question. Um, I, I checked in with uh, my colleagues at Mass Council on Aging and the Executive Office of Elder Affairs on this question today. And they have responded that it is an individual town's decision between the Council on Aging and the local Board of Health. There is some guidance on mass.gov for those organizations to uh, follow when it comes to making decisions about reopening for our programs and services at senior centers. And so we're looking to compile some information to support local senior centers in working with their boards of health to make um, decisions about how and when senior centers can open. But it's a, I, I'm uh, told that it's a local decision and that it's up to each individual senior center. So if you have questions about that, you can contact your local council on aging or senior center and ask what their reopening plans are. And they can also reach out to us or Elder Affairs uh, if they have questions or need guidance or support in that reopening planning process. Thanks, Lynn. Anyone else? All right, well, that brings us to the a close of um, this forum. I would like to thank our panelists again for sharing their expertise and their experience. And again, thank you, Evie, for sharing your personal experience with us tonight. Uh, we hope this has been worthwhile for those of you who have, who have tuned in um, and that you have found answers to the questions you were seeking. A special thanks to Carol Foote and to Phoebe Walker for their efforts in planning this event. And thanks to Nick Ring and his staff at GCTV for hosting this forum and broadcasting out to other local cable access stations and social media sites. As parting words, I want to recognize that we have been living through a remarkably uncertain and difficult time. I want to share a quote with you I recently read. For the first time since the pandemic began, I can sense that optimism is spreading faster than the virus. So with that sense of hope, let us all take the information we've learned tonight and use it to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our community. Thank you.